My name is Aisha Dasgupta, and I'll be presenting on behalf of my collaborator, Partha Dasgupta, who also happens to be my dad. And we'll be talking about global ecological footprint, uh, population, and the sustainable development goals. I have to start by saying that in this presentation, the views expressed are our own. They don't necessarily reflect the views of the United Nations. In 1950, global population was around two and a half billion people and global GDP was a bit over eight trillion dollars. So the average person's annual income was around three thousand dollars, which is pretty high by historical standards. Since then, the world has prospered beyond recognition. Life expectancy at birth has increased from 46 in 1950 to 72 today. The proportion of the world's population living in extreme poverty has fallen from around 60% to less than 10% today. And today the global population is 7.7 .7 billion. And global GDP per capita has risen to $15,000. So global GDP is a bit over $120 trillion meaning that global, global economic activity has increased 14 times in just 70 years. That's something that's not remotely been experienced before. But this extraordinary achievement has come at a life-threatening price and one which environmental scientists have been pointing to for some time. We're causing species extinctions, at 100 to 1,000 times the average extinction rate over the past tens of millions of years, and the rate's continuing to rise. The biosphere is being so degraded by our activities that a number of vital regulating and maintenance services that we enjoy from it are increasingly threatened, the most prominent in the public eye being the stable climate in which our economies have evolved. Some earth scientists have proposed that the middle of the 20th century should be regarded as the time when we entered a new era, the Anthropocene. Ehrlich and Holdren, in their famous 1971 paper, introduced the equation IPAT to trace humanity's impact, that's I, on the biosphere, to population size, that's P, affluence, that's the A, and technology in use, T. Today, we more commonly know Ehrlich's and Holdren's impact as the ecological footprint. So how large is our current overshoot? The Global Footprint Network reports that the ratio of the global ecological footprint to the ability of the biosphere to supply that footprint on a sustainable basis increased from one in 1970 to around 1.7 today. In other words, in the late 1960s, the global ecological footprint was sustainable, but it is not today. We can interpret the, one, the figure 1.7 as the number of Earths that would be needed to match humanity's demands of the biosphere on a sustainable basis. In September 2015, the United Nations General Assembly agreed on an agenda for sustainable development. The member states committed themselves to meeting 17 sustainable development goals by the year 2030, with 169 socioeconomic targets. International agreement on the SDGs was a remarkable and even noble achievement because the goals and picked lives, features of lives that would enable us to live well. But there's a problem. The goals aren't accompanied by an examination of whether assuming they can all be achieved, they're sustainable. For example, the SDGs are reticent about population, and yet it's difficult to regard them to be sustainable unless they're studied in the context of global population and its distribution within and across countries. It's been argued that the goal to resist the increase in mean global temperature to two degrees from that in the pre-industrial revolution era is unlikely to be met unless population growth is reduced substantially. But even the recent Paris Agreement on climate change 
made no mention of population, nor the lack of access to contraception and safe abortion services for many of the world's poorest women. Women's education is prominent in the SDGs, and it's regarded by many development experts as the surest route to women's empowerment and preferences for smaller families. All governments insist on the importance of women's education for empowering women, but even today, nearly 30% of young women aged 15 to 24 in, in low-income countries are illiterate. In contrast, family planning and reproductive health care programs are affordable by governments, even in low-income countries. The rationale for expanding the reach of family planning programs lies in the 257 million women globally today who report that they want to stop or delay childbearing, but are not using a modern method of contraception. This is women living with unmet need for family planning. Today, the largest numbers of women with an unmet need for modern contraceptive methods are found in Central and Southern Asia, Eastern and Southeastern Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. It shouldn't be surprising that there were 120 million unintended pregnancies each year, nor that an estimated 61% of all unintended pregnancies end in an abortion, uh, many of which are conducted in unsafe conditions. In addition to reducing unintended pregnancies, contraceptive use enhances women's own health and that of her children by helping her to space births and by providing greater opportunities for education, women's empowerment and income. Family planning programs offer a low hanging fruit to governments for empowering women, yet they remain very low on the development agenda. Today, less than 1% of international aid is devoted to family planning. It's a paradox. So where are we headed? The United Nations median projection of world population at the end of the century is 10.9 billion people, with an uncertainty interval of between nine and a half and 12.7 billion. More than three quarters of the increase from today's 7.7 billion is expected to be in Sub-Saharan Africa, where population in 2100 is projected to rise from today's 1.1 billion to 3.8 billion at the end of the century. Comprising around 14% of the world's population, Sub-Saharan Africa represents only 3% of the global economy. So Sub-Saharan Africa cannot remotely be held responsible for the global environmental problems that we face today. Far more significant are the contributions of high-income countries and emerging economies. But Sub-Saharan Africa's high fertility rate, which is almost five births per woman, and the rapid population growth is problematic for its own future prospects. Attempts to raise incomes in Sub-Saharan Africa, even to the current global average income, which is around $17,000, in the face of a near 3 billion rise in numbers, would require an increase in the region's annual output from $3.5 trillion to around $68 trillion. That rise, assuming it's even possible, is likely to have serious adverse consequences for the region's ecology. Finally, I wanted to, set, to share some thoughts from my own personal experiences. As, as an undergraduate, I studied anthropology at UCL. And as you can imagine, um, I was extremely thrilled to be invited to this conference. I've worked for an NGO, I've worked at an academic institution, and I got my PhD at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in demography. I now work as a demographer at the United Nations, initially in New York and now in Geneva. In a paper that addressed a wider set of issues in demography than is customary in my profession at the Population and Environment Nexus, I collaborated with an economist. In a more recent paper, on an even wider set of issues, that is the population consumption environment nexus, I collaborated with a group of anthropologists, economists, ecologists, environmental scientists, and a demographer. 
That enlargement was possible because the group knows one another through an international institute in ecological economics. The group respects one another and finds the, the experience of teaching and learning from one another both rewarding and enjoyable. It can be rare today, but it's important. Thank you.